Hello Set Apart Saints, this is David, and in this video I'm going to talk about what is the Antichrist Beast of Revelation. If you haven't done so, I recommend watching the previous videos in this Revelation series so that the explanation is in context. If you're benefiting from the videos, please like them, make comments, and share them so that YouTube lists them for others to learn. If you want more information about the fulfillment of Revelation, the Revelation Timeline Decoded book provides it in detail. I've included a link in the video description. People have different perspectives about what is the Antichrist, so that's what I'm going to address in this video. The language of Revelation 13 can seem confusing because Revelation 12 points to the pagan Roman Empire, and that's the fourth beast of Daniel. And then, in Revelation 13.1, it describes a beast rising up out of the sea, so it seems like a new beast. But as we saw in the last video about the Antichrist beast, it's the same Roman beast kingdom, but Messiah is describing a new phase with a new leader, the popes of Rome. We see that it's the same beast as Daniel described in Daniel 7 with a horn, a leader, the popes of Rome, who rose to power over the ten kingdoms of the fallen Roman Empire, who speak blasphemy and make war with the saints. In Revelation 13, 11 through 18, we'll see the last phase of the Roman beast kingdom with a new leader, the false prophet. That points to two horns, two leaders who pretend to serve Messiah, like a lamb, but really serve Satan, the dragon, the false prophet, Jesuit superior general, and the Antichrist beast pope, the black pope and the white pope. We see confirmation of this in Revelation 16, 13, when the unholy alliance of Satan, the dragon, the Antichrist beast and the false prophet carry out evil plans to push the world into their one world government. Another confirmation is in Revelation 19.20, when the Antichrist beast and the false prophet are effectively captured and cast into the lake of fire. So again, it's pointing to two leaders of the end times Roman beast kingdom. And then in Revelation 22, Satan the dragon is bound and cast into the bottomless pit. We see personal pronouns used in Revelation 13 to point to the leaders, the Antichrist beast and the false prophet, the men who pretend to be priests of Messiah in order to better make war with him and his saints. The popes teach concepts that are unscriptural and anti-Messiah. John told us, Who is a liar but he that denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is the Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. So, how does the Antichrist beast pope deny Messiah? They proclaim to be the leader, the high priest of Messiah's church, which denies Messiah as their sole high priest. They teach a false gospel of works, denying salvation through Messiah alone. They carry out the Babylonian mystery religion, denying the pure faith of Messiah. They teach that Mary is the mediator to the Father, which denies Messiah. They teach that Mary was sinless, which denies Messiah. They have proclaimed that salvation is only through them in the Catholic Church, denying that it's only through Messiah. They teach that their popes and priests can forgive sins, which denies Messiah. The popes have used their priests and Catholics to torture and kill millions of Messiah saints, thus they are anti-Messiah. The popes deny the Father by proclaiming that they are God on earth, and they have taken the title of Holy Father, which denies the Heavenly Father. The popes proclaim that salvation is only through them. Pope Innocent III said, We believe, and with our lips we confess but one church, not that of the heretics, pointing to the saints, but the Holy Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church, outside which we believe that no one is saved. Pope Boniface VIII said, We are compelled, our faith urging us, to believe and to hold, and we do firmly believe and simply confess, that there is one Holy Catholic Apostolic Church, outside of which there is neither salvation nor remission of sins. We declare, say, define, and pronounce that it is absolutely necessary for the salvation of every human creature to be subject to the Roman Pontiff. Pope Eugene IV said, No one, let his almsgiving be as great as it may, no one, even if he pour out his blood for the name of Jesus Christ, can be saved unless they abide within the bosom and unity of the Catholic Church. Pope Gregory XVI said, It is not possible to worship God truly except in her. All who are outside her will not be saved, and the her, of course, is the Roman Catholic Church. Pope Pius IX said, It must be held by faith that outside the apostolic Roman Church no one can be saved that this is the only ark of salvation, that he who shall not have entered therein will perish in the flood. Pope Clement XI said, No man outside obedience to the Pope of Rome can ultimately be saved. All who have raised themselves against the faith of the Roman Church and died in final impenitence have been damned and gone down to hell. Pope Leo XII said, We profess that there is no salvation outside the Catholic Church, for the Church is the pillar and ground of truth. With reverence to those words, Augustine says, 
If any man be outside the church, he will be excluded from the number of sons, and will not have God for the fathers, since he has not the church for mother. Pope Leo the Thirteenth said, Remember and understand well where Peter is. There is the church, that those who refuse to associate in communion with the chair of Peter belong to Antichrist, not to Christ. He would separate himself from the Roman pontiff, has no further bond with Christ. This is our last lesson to you. Receive it, engrave it in your minds, all of you. By God's commandment, salvation is to be found nowhere but in the church. Pope Pius X said, It is our duty to recall that everyone, great and small, as the holy Pontiff Gregory did in ages past, the absolute necessity, which is ours, to have recourse to this church to effect our eternal salvation. Pope Pius XII said, O Mary, Mother of mercy and refuge of sinners, we beseech thee to look with pitying eyes on poor heretics and schismatics. Do thou, which art the seat of wisdom, enlighten the minds wretchedly enfolded in the darkness of ignorance and sin, that they may clearly recognize the holy, Catholic, Roman Church to be the only true Church of Jesus Christ, outside of which neither sanctity nor salvation can be found. Pope Pius XII said, It is absolutely necessary that the Christian community be subject in all things to the sovereign pontiff, if he wishes to be a part of divinely established society founded by our Redeemer. By divine mandate, the interpreter and guarder of the scriptures and the depository of sacred tradition living within her. The church alone is the entrance to salvation. She alone, by herself, and under the protection and guidance of the Holy Spirit, is the source of truth. Pope Benedict XV said, Such is the nature of the Catholic faith, that it does not admit of more or less, but must be held as a whole, as a whole rejected. This is the Catholic faith, which unless a man believe faithfully and firmly, he cannot be saved. Pope Pius XI said, The Catholic Church alone is keeping the true worship. This is the font of truth. This is the house of faith. This is the temple of God. If any man enter not here, or if any man go forth from it, he is a stranger to the hope of life and salvation. Pope John XXIII said, Into this fold of Jesus Christ no man may enter unless he be led by the sovereign pontiff, and only if they be united to him can men be saved. So why did I read all of those quotes from the popes? Because today's prophecy teachers don't tell you how the popes have proclaimed to be Messiah, that they have deceived billions of Catholics with a false gospel, which is anti-Messiah. Feigning to be a priest of Messiah, but then proclaiming that salvation is only through them, denies Messiah, thus the popes are antichrist. Henry Grattan Guinness records this quote from William Tyndale. Though the Bishop of Rome and his sect give Christ these names, his rightful names, yet in that they rob him of the effect and take the signification of his names unto themselves and make of him but a hypocrite. As they themselves be, they be the right Antichrist and deny both the Father and the Son. For they deny the witness that the Father bore unto his Son and deprive the Son of all the power and glory that his Father gave to him. Messiah told us in Matthew 7:15, Beware of false prophets, false priests, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. The popes take the place of Christ, which is Antichrist. Webster's 1828 Dictionary, which is based on the King James, describes anti as a preposition signifying against, opposite, contrary, or in place of. So people always think it's just against. That's all they think. That's the only definition, and that's part of it. But the other part is that it's in place of. Since the 5th century, the popes of Rome have proclaimed the title of Vicar of Christ, which means in place of Christ. Therefore, he is proclaiming that he's Antichrist. The word vicarious is a legal term, which means substituting for or in place of. So they are legally declaring to take Messiah's place. Antichrist doesn't mean just against Christ, but also in place of Christ. And that's exactly what the title Vicar of Christ means. Vicarius file de, Latin, vicar or representative of the Son of God, is a phrase first used in the forged medieval donation of Constantine to refer to St. Peter, whom they proclaim as the first Catholic Church Pope. Pope Boniface VIII said, We declare, assert, define, and pronounce to be subject to the Roman pontiff is to every creature altogether necessary for salvation. I have the authority of the King of Kings. I am all in all and above all, so that God himself and I, the Vicar of Christ, have but one consistory, and I am able to do almost all that God can do. What, therefore, can you make of me but God? What blasphemy. Pope Pius VIII said, I alone am the successor of the apostles, the Vicar of Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Pope Pius X declared, The Pope is not simply the representative of Jesus Christ. On the contrary, he is Jesus Christ himself, under the veil of flesh. Does the Pope speak? It is Jesus Christ who is speaking. Hence, when anyone speaks of the Pope, it is not necessary to examine but to obey. Wow. 
Pope Pius XI proclaim in the Vatican throne room, before kneeling cardinals, bishops, priests, and nuns, you know that I am the Holy Father, the representative of God of earth, the vicar of Christ, which means that I am God on the earth. These blasphemous papal proclamations oppose our Messiah, who is our sole intercessor to the Father, the way, the truth, and the life. We can see that the Antichrist beast Pope fulfills both definitions of Antichrist, in place of and contrary to Messiah. Interestingly, Pope Gregory wrote to the Byzantine Emperor Maurice in 597 concerning the titles of bishops. I say with confidence that whoever calls or desires to call himself universal priest and self-exaltation of himself is a precursor of the Antichrist. The Greek roots of the term Catholic mean according to the whole or universal. By that, we can see that the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, is the universal priest and thus the Antichrist. In Romanism and the Reformation, Henry Grattan Guinness said, Thus Christ is eclipsed. Salvation is stolen. The papal priest is substituted for the Savior of sinners. The mystery of iniquity for the mystery of godliness. The proud Pope of Rome for the Holy Prince of Peace. Poison for food. And Satan himself is palmed upon the Church of Jesus Christ as her head and husband. Babylon, in the Apocalypse, is the city and the harlot. Jerusalem, in the same book, is the city and the bride. The former is the corrupt associate of the earthly kings, the latter the chaste bride of the heavenly king. The latter is the church, the former then is no mere heathen metropolis. The contrast is between church and church, the faithful church and the apostate church. It has its own savior, the church. It has its own sacrifice, the mass. It has its own mediator, the clergy, and Mary. It has its own salvation, the sacrament. It has its own justification, self-righteousness. It has its own forgiveness, the confession. And in heaven, it has its own infallible, all-powerful advocate, the mother of God, Mary, a representative unknown to the gospel. In Rise and Fall of the Papacy, Robert Fleming said that the great enemy of Christ and his church represented in the book of Revelation under the figurative names of Babylon and the woman who sits on the scarlet-covered beast is Rome, anti-Christian, or the papal church, we thought to be a position beyond all doubt among Protestants. The prophecy cannot admit of an application to any other. The whole description answers to an ecclesiastic power supporting a system of idolatry, superstition, corrupt doctrine, and tyranny, a power which has managed this stated opposition to the followers of Christ, of the true religion, not for a short time, but during a succession of many ages. So the popes fulfill the number 666. Revelation 13, 18 says, Here is wisdom. Let him that have understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is 600, three score, and six. Rome is the Latin kingdom, and the word Latinos, the Latin man, identifies the Antichrist beast. No name appears more proper and suitable than the one mentioned by Arrhenius, who lived not long after St. John's time and was the disciple of Polycarp. He said that the name Latinos contains the number of 666, and it is very likely because the last kingdom is so called, for they are Latins who now reign. In treaties on the Antichrist in the 3rd century, Hippolytus of Portus said, It is manifest to all that those who at present still hold the power are Latins. If then we take the name or number 666 as the name of the single man, it becomes Latinus. In the papal system, from its origin to the present time, William Cathcart said, It is also a notable fact that Pope Vitalian was the first to ordain public worship should be celebrated in the Latin tongue, in the year 666, the year with the same number as the Antichrist beast. The Council of Trent declared that the Mass must be celebrated in Latin. The Latin Church is one of the proper names of the mighty papal sect, just as the Greek Church describes the Eastern Orthodox denomination. The documents of the popes and of the Roman court, intended for the ecclesiastical authorities of the lands, have been written in Latin from the earliest times and are still communicated in the same grand old tongue. The People's New Testament by Barton Johnson says the Greek did not express numbers by figures, but by letters, just as among the Romans. X stood for 10, C for 100. 666 could be expressed as spelling out the words in the Greek language or by using the letters which were symbols for various quantities. Greek Latinos equals 666. And what is this name? The number of a man. The Greek method of spelling the name Latinus, the reputed founder of the Latin race. The Romans were a Latin race and spoke the Latin language. The Romish church is continually, officially called the Latin church, to distinguish it from the Greek church, the other branch of the great ancient schism. The Catholic sacred books are written in Latin tongue. The worship is conducted in every country in Latin alone. 
and when the catholic council convenes all its conferences are conducted in the tongue of the ancient latins there is then a latin church whose official and sacred speech is the latin language which has for its seat the ancient latin capital that church is the great apostate church upon whose names the names of blasphemy have been written which has claimed universal dominion upon the earth and has slain the saints of the most high it is the name of the beast and that name latinos the name and number of a man is six 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 it does not destroy the force of this that these numerals and letters can be so combined as to spell out other names this name is one that at once points to a power which is displayed every mark which is assigned to the beast revelation thirteen eighteen says six 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 is the number of a man the pope's title is vicar of christ which is latin for vicarius file dei which equates numerically to the number 666 in latin but the narrative gets more wicked as the pope's crucifix is the evil image of 666 of the antichrist beast popes let me explain the new testament was written in greek so we have to look at the greek representation of 600 three score and six the strong's greek dictionary words are chai zai stigma chai has a numerical value of 600 it's abbreviation for christ zai has a numerical value of 60 and it's abbreviation for zulon a beam from which anyone is suspended a cross stigma is a ligature of the greek letters sigma and tau sigma has a numerical value of six and it means a hole or mark pierced with the pointed instrument on the hands the plural is stigmata pointing to the nails that affix messiah to the cross so chai christ zai the beam on which he was crucified stigma the nails which affix him to the cross it's pointing exactly to the image that you see every pope every catholic priest every catholic church probably every catholic in the world has in their house the crucifix so 666 chai zai stigma points to the crucifix of the antichrist beast popes in their harlot church but it has a more sinister meaning we celebrate that messiah died on the cross and then rose again galatians 3:13 says christ had to redeem us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us for it is written cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree the pope keeps him on the cross which openly curses him and mocks him see messiah was on the cross he died for our sins on the cross but he was taken down he was put in the tomb and then he rose again but what the pope is doing here symbolically is keeping him on the cross continually galatians says curses everyone that hangs on a cross so right there the pope the antichrist the enemy of messiah is every time you see a crucifix it's cursing messiah interestingly they remove the second commandment about making graven images and bowing to them and they split the tenth commandment into two the pope so you look at the roman catholic church ten commandments it's missing the second commandment from scripture they removed it the 666 crucifix is displayed in catholic churches worldwide where they carry out their babylonian mystery religion during the blasphemous eucharist ceremony in front of a crucifix that mocks our messiah and popes use the bent cross, which features a distorted figure of Messiah hanging on it, mocking Messiah even more. And you can Google Pope bent cross to see what I'm talking about. And here's an image of that. And here's here's this crucifix, right? And it's this bent cross, and it's got Messiah in this distorted position hanging down. And he's openly mocking Messiah by keeping him on the cross. So do you see what the term Antichrist and the number 666 mean? It's all hidden in plain sight. In the approaching end of the age, Henry Grattan Guinness said, at the coronation of Pope Innocent X, Cardinal Corona, on his knees, in his own name, and that of the clergy of St. Peter's, addresses the following words to the popes. Most holy and blessed Father, head of the church, ruler of the world, to whom the kings of the kingdom of heaven are committed, whom the angels in heaven revere, and the gates of hell fear, and all the worlds adore. We specially venerate, worship, and adore thee. Guinness says this feature of the little horn of Daniel 7, the son of perdition of 2 Thessalonians 2, and the Antichrist beast is marvelously fulfilled in the papacy. What a mouth has that Latin ruler. What a talker. What a teacher. What a thunderer. How has he boasted himself and magnified himself and excommunicated and anathematized all who have resisted him? Has the world ever seen his equal in respect? All the Gothic kings were his humble servants. He has, by his own account, and is the representative of Christ, of God, ruler of the world, armed with all the powers of Christ in heaven, earth, and hell. He is infallible. His decrees are irreformable. A mouth indeed is his, a mouth speaking great things. In The Papacy of the Antichrist, by Reverend James Aiken Wiley, he says, The man of sin is a priest who is the opposite of Messiah, who is without sin. If Antichrist signifies a vice-Christ, that is, one who comes in the room of Christ, deception, dissimulation, 
counterfeit must be an essential element in his character. The Antichrist has to fit all of the description, not just some. An open enemy, an atheist, is not pretending to be Christ. Romanism alone meets all the requirements of prophecy and exhibits all the features of the vice Christ. And it does so with the completeness and the truthfulness which enable the man who permits himself to be guided by the statements of the Word of God on the one hand and the facts of history on the other to say at once, this is the Antichrist. Daniel called him a little horn. Paul called him the man of sin, the son of perdition. John called him the beast. Why just the beast? Because he is the primary leader of the Roman beast who is the adversary of Messiah. John said, Who is a liar but he that denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is the Antichrist that denies the Father and Son. If he comes boldly and truthfully avowing himself the enemy of Christ, how is he a liar? Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. From the beginning, Satan had made the line of error to run parallel with the line of truth. Beginning his career in the days of Paul, it was not until the 13th century that the man of sin reached his maturity and stood before the world full grown. During all these ages, he kept stretching himself higher and higher, piling assumption upon assumption and prerogative upon prerogative, till at last he raised himself to a height from which he looked down, not only upon all churches, but upon all kings and kingdoms. In approaching into the age, Henry Grattan continued, The fact is that the things which John first saw have come to pass. Their fulfillment is written on the page of history in the letters of blood and flame. There has arisen in the sphere of the Roman Empire, and there has reigned in, and from the city of Rome, the seven-hilled city of the Caesars, just such a power as is predicted of the apocalypse. Translate the symbolic language of the prophecy into plain, non-figurative terms, and it becomes the history of the last 12 to 14 centuries. As its head is an aged pontiff, claiming the highest authority in the world as the visible representative deity, the vicar of Christ, the head of the church of Christ on earth. Let me end this video by pointing out that the Roman Catholic Church is the church of Satan. I know that's harsh, but we'll just hear what the Catholics have to say about it. Emmanuel Malingo was an exorcist for the Catholic Church who wrote the book Face to Face with the Devil. He gave a speech entitled Satanists at Work in the Vatican. To an audience of Catholic bishops, priests, nuns, and laity, he said, The devil in the Catholic Church is so protected, not that he is like an animal protected by the government, put on the game preserve that outlaws anyone, especially hunters, from trying to capture or kill it. The devil within the church today is actually protected by certain church authorities. Catholic priest Malachi Martin is quoted as saying, Archbishop Malingo is a good bishop, and his contention that there are Satanists in Rome is completely correct. Anyone who is acquainted with the state of affairs in the Vatican in the last 35 years is well aware that the Prince of Darkness has had and still has a surrogate in the courts of St. Peter's in Rome. Now let's hear from two of the most well-respected Catholic cardinals to see their view of the Roman Catholic Church, which is very telling. Cardinal and Archbishop of Westminster, Henry Edward Manning, gave this assessment of his church. A system like this is so unlike anything human. It has upon its notes, tokens, marks, so altogether supernatural, that men now acknowledge it to be either Christ or Antichrist. There is no alternative between these extremes. The Catholic Church is either the masterpiece of Satan or the kingdom of the Son of God. Manning also proclaimed, but the Church of Jesus Christ, and he's pointing to the Roman Catholic Church, within the sphere of revelation of faith and morals, is this all, or is this nothing, or worse than nothing, an imposture and a usurpation? That is, it is Christ or Antichrist. Cardinal John Henry Newman put it even more bluntly. Another serious question is this, whether a branch of Christ's Church not merely has evil extensively prevailing within it, but is actually the kingdom of evil the kingdom of God's enemy. The question really lies, be it observed, between these two alternatives, either the Church of Rome is the house of God or the house of Satan. There is no middle ground between them. Those statements are quite astounding. The Apostle Paul warned us in 2 Corinthians 11, 14-15, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. The Vatican is located on top of the catacombs of the pagan temple of Cybele. There is a phallic symbol of the Egyptian sun god in the middle of a sun wheel in front of St. Peter's Basilica, which designates it as a temple of sun god worship. Inside we see a massive sunburst symbol, statues of pagan gods, the 666 crucifix, and an extravagant throne. The Roman Catholic Church is the masterpiece of Satan, designed to hide the true faith and subvert Messiah. It is the tares church which was planted by the enemy. Recall that Satan caused Emperor Constantine and the Roman bishops to create Romanism, Roman Christianity, which has the veneer of the scriptural faith but is symbolically worshipping false gods, which brings Satan honor and glory. 
Satan has done much more damage to the true faith by creating Romanism in the harlot Roman Catholic Church than he did with the pagan Roman emperors who persecuted the saints. In the name of Messiah, the Roman Catholic Church has carried out atrocious acts, which have turned people away from the true faith of Scripture because of the association. Catholic children are traumatized by nuns' harsh treatment in school, and they run away from the Heavenly Father. Young boys who are sexually violated by priests turn away from the true faith. Nuns and priests who commit these crimes may be chastised, but they rarely face criminal persecution because the Roman Catholic-controlled system is designed to protect its own. It's not an exaggeration to call the Roman Catholic Church of the Antichrist Beast Popes the Church of Satan, for her cardinals have openly declared it. This is why Messiah commanded his saints to come out of her. The popes of Rome proclaimed to lead Messiah's one true church, but they deceived Catholics with the false gospel of works, and that Mary is the intercessor to the Father, which denies Messiah. Their teachings are against Messiah. They have proclaimed themselves to be the vicar of Christ, to take his place, thus they are Antichrist. The popes have taken the title of Holy Father, and have proclaimed to forgive sins and provide salvation, thus they deny the Heavenly Father. The popes have changed the laws and the times, thus they pretend to be God on earth. The popes have tortured and persecuted Messiah's saints and banned and burned the scriptures, revealing their hatred for the Heavenly Father and Messiah. They use the wicked crucifix, which corresponds to 666, as they keep Messiah on the cross in churches and Catholic homes worldwide, putting him to open shame. The enemy is hidden in plain sight, yet most people can't see how the popes of Rome fulfill Bible prophecy as the Antichrist beast, which leads the harlot church of Rome. In the next video, I'll show you how the iron clay feet of the statue in Daniel 2 point to the popes using the Muslims of Islam for their agenda. That's all for today. Love y'all. Shalom.